Welcome to our new show, the What Anyone Can Do podcast with Leo Batari and me, Randy Cantrell. Our new show picks up where the last show, Year of the Peer, left off, highlighting the simple truth that who you surround yourself with matters, and that if we enlist the support of others, give back to those who give to us, and pay it forward for the next generation, we can do anything. Author and keynote speaker Leo Batari and I will interview a diverse group of thought leaders who will share stories and insights that will help you succeed in business and in life. How? By doing the things anyone can do, but most of us never will. Welcome back to another episode of What Anyone Can Do, the podcast. My name is Randy Cantrell. I'm in Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. He is Leo Batari, coming from Southern Cal, San Diego to be precise. Greetings. That's right. How are you? I'm doing very well. I'm doing very well. I'm still, um, you know, I've, I've finally, you know, recovered from, uh, you know, the um, post Stanley cost, you know, <laughs> and uh Stanley Cup Finals, but uh, what did Dennis Leary do the video, or, um, some <laughs> video before Game Seven, where he talked about how <laughs> yeah. know, we haven't had a parade in four months? Come on, exactly. Um, so you know, we we have nothing to complain about, you know, um, in New England as far as all yeah. the sports. Yeah, yeah. Now, are. now it's now it's the uh, it's the boys of summer. It's their time. So yeah, um, and around and around here, it's not. I'm not a big baseball fan, but it's it's of course the Rangers. They've People have been rather surprised. They're over 500. And nobody thought they would be that. So it's dog yeah. days around here. Everybody's keeping their eye on the NFL. So this is Cal Dallas Cowboy country. Big well, time. that's for sure. I mean, between that and the NBA draft and, uh, you know, it's um, – uh, and, and you know, the baseball is just such a long season. I mean, the, the, the Sox clearly need a better back half than the front, front half of the season. But uh, we'll be hitting the all-star break soon. And, you know, yeah. it's, it kind of brings me here we are – we're getting near halfway the baseball season. We're obviously July 1st begins the second half of, of the year for us. And I think it may be a good, uh, you know, time to reflect on, um, and I think I'd mentioned this in one of my What Anyone Can Do minutes where I'd asked people, not only did they accomplish their New Year's resolution, but do they even remember what it was? <laughs> right. <laughs> because... Uh, according to the University of Scranton, as we've talked about on occasion, uh, 92% of people fail at the New Year's resolution. And interestingly enough, uh, if you think companies are any better at uh, achieving their strategic goals, their failure rate, if you believe um, uh, Norton and Kaplan, who were authors of the Balanced Scorecard, will tell you it's 90% there. So, I mean, I think it's something to look at as we begin the back half of this year and really take stock of how are we doing? You know, what are we doing, you know, with our lives? What are we doing with our companies? And, uh, you know, what are the kinds of things that we can start thinking about uh, going forward? You know, I, I think that, you know, individuals and companies tend to fail for different reasons. Um, and uh, so maybe we can talk about individuals first, right? Yes. Um, and of and course, I suspect a lot of that failure happens really quick. Oh, totally. Oh, within weeks. Yeah. yeah. They talk about yeah. the fact that... Yeah. The give up factor is probably pretty quick. The give up factor is fast. Um, everyone is all, you know, in whatever good cheer you are on, on New Year's Eve right. thinking about, oh yeah, here's my New Year's resolution. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And what I think makes it more remarkable is most people's New Year's resolution aren't like, like they're trying to, you know... Um, make the Olympics or something, right? Yeah, they're not yeah. trying to be right. elected. Not trying to land on Mars or anything. To, you know, they, they, they're fairly within reason, you know, right. goals. And yet still, uh, somehow they elude us. Um, uh, talking to someone the other day who basically said, you know, we're really good. And he was talking specifically about Americans that really get at getting things started. And we're not always great at the, <laughs> at the follow through. <laughs> and getting it done. And I think there's some uh, truth to that. But I also think, and of course, the premise of the book, what anyone could do is that if you can surround yourself with really good people, which is, I think, something that anyone can do, 
you will do the things that anyone can do far more often. And, you know, as we've said, success really is about not doing superhuman things. It's basically uh, doing the things that anyone can do, but just most of us never will. And oftentimes when we look at the little everyday things that have to happen in order for us to accomplish what I think are some pretty modest and, and achievable goals, and yet we still, uh, we don't. Um, and I think we, we've got to figure out how to enlist and engage people around us to help us get what we want. Well, and I think in our lifetime, as more mature guys, it seems to me that it has certainly changed for the individual because of the, the mounting pressure of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm reminiscing back to our conversation with Rich about his book, Late Bloomers, and that pressure, you know, to always have that Instagram moment and be successful and kind of not show your underwear, but it's in those moments where you kind of need somebody that you're willing to show your underwear to, to help you push past that. I don't know. I, I just, I look at, at younger people today and was reminiscing about my early career with somebody who was in their forties the other day. And I'm like, you know, it's, you are in a whole different world than the world that I came up in, in my twenties. And I'm not, I'm not judging it as either good or bad. It's just different. Well, certainly back then you would never admit to anyone that you didn't know what you were doing or That's right. the- <laughs> Exactly. exactly. <laughs> the answer to something or you, it, it was the whole fake it till you make it. It was that the whole kind of thing where I think today it's far more uh, permissible. Even the, the, you know, the expression about men being terrible, asking for directions, you mm. know, they would drive around lost for two hours <laughs> before they would ask someone who lives in the damn town to right. say, Hey, here, where is this place? And you know how easy that is. And yet yeah. we are not, we, we certainly weren't in our generation conditioned to do that. I'd like to think that uh, both in terms of models of leadership and with the way uh, young people are raised today, that asking for help, asking for answers to their questions, asking, um, you know, others is mm-hmm. far less problematic than it, it used to be. Would you say? Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, what, what leaps out in your mind when it comes to the individual and the real challenge or the, or the, or the thing that makes them quit the fastest or however you want to look at it? Yeah, there's a number of things. Um, you know, you could argue that people didn't really want it that badly to begin with. I think that's one of the things that you can kind of look at. I, I think University of Scranton, when they talk about a bit of the failure rate there, that has a lot to do with it. Like we say we want to lose 10 pounds. We say we want to do this, that, or the other. But, you know, we're not really willing to do what it takes yeah. to do that. You know, conversely, I think when we talk about companies, companies are great at also at setting goals oftentimes. Um, and they pay attention to what, whatever that end goal is, and they pay less attention, I think, to what it's going to take to make that goal happen, right? What are, what are the metrics around? It, mm-hmm. It's the difference between measuring outcomes and outputs, right? Yep. And, and oftentimes, it's so helpful to measure the outputs as well as the outcomes, because if you don't achieve the right outcome, you really don't have any idea whether it was a poorly, uh, it was a bad strategy or just a poorly executed strategy, right? right. It, could be, it could have been a great idea, poorly executed, and next thing you know, it gets tossed aside and you're going to do something else when, in fact, all you needed to do was tweak a bit of what you were doing and do it a lot better, and you would achieve the goal. So, Yeah, I'm reminded. Did, you know, when you said that, you know, this Michaela Schifrin, who is a world-class downhill skier and slalom skier, which a sport I know nothing about, men or women. It, it won't keep it's us from Texas, talking about it, though. You know, so, yeah, no, no. <laughs> but when she was young, when she was young, and her dad was, a, was a, from what I understood, was a ski instructor. And while other girls her age were competing on the world stage, she was at, at a ski training facility old school that had the old the old kind of seats where you don't take your skis off you you just sit in this thing and you go up the hill very slowly your skis are on the ground and you're watching the other the other people 
that are being trained, you're watching them come down. Yeah. And she's doing it day after day after day after day, a lot of reps. And other people are like, you know, you're wasting your time and other people are competing. They're winning cups and whatever. But the value of that old school style of not just the repetition of going down the hill, but going back up the hill and watching other contestants come down the hill or kids being trained and watching what they're doing and learning not only from your own skiing, but from their skiing on the hill. And here she is today, world class, and she attributes much of it to that process, not fixated on, okay, you're 18, you got to be on the world stage, you got to be winning cups and titles. And Well, and I, I think you're right. I think it speaks to Rich Krogard's book. It speaks to a lot of us wanting everything now, you know. Um, yeah. you, you, want, you might want to lose 10 pounds, you might want to lose 20 pounds, but you want to lose it now. You're not right. willing to wait, you're not willing to do right. it takes during that time uh, to make that happen. And, you know, it, it, it speaks to a great uh, tenet in um, Peter Senge's The Fifth Discipline, where he talks about how um, slower is often much faster. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I, when I think about, um, so, so I'm the worst, for example, or, or at least I used to be. I like to think that I'm, I've made, you know, improvements in this after nearly 60 years. Um, but when something would arrive in the, um, you know, by UPS or whatever, and it had to be assembled, right? Do I read the directions first? Oh, no. You know, I've got to go and just start yeah. trying to put it together. And, and many things usually happen there. First of all, there's a bunch of extra parts. I'm wondering, all right, I clearly missed something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or it's put together improperly, or I try to force a part into something, and they break yeah. it, or any, any number of bad things. Or you realize you didn't have all the parts to begin <clears> with. But either way, <laughs> Had I actually spent time and, and done what they say to do, read the directions from beginning to end, put everything where it belongs, put it together in a methodical way, you will get it done correctly and that much faster pretty much every time. And yeah. so... <laughs> yeah, well, it's that age old effect. If you don't have time to do it over, you know, if you don't have time to do it right the first time, when are you going to have time to do it over? You know, yeah. in, in Strengths Finders, it's that, it's that person who's the activator. You know, the person who says, right. all right, let's go. Got to, got to move, got to get started. Yeah. And the deliberator is the one clearly who's saying, whoa, wait a minute. We can't do like shoot, ready, aim, you know, this yeah. kind of thing here, right? right. We got to um, hold on. And obviously companies need both kinds of people. You know, you need someone who is going to get things started, but you also need people who um, are, are, are check that, you know, as well. But, um, but it is true. And, and we aren't always we're just impatient. We're just really at the end of it. We're impatient and we want it now and <laughs> we're not willing to do and, and, and left to our own devices. And when, when we are, we are accountable to no one other than ourselves, and it's like, well, who's going to know what's the big deal. It's a big difference from stating publicly to maybe some of your friends or whatever. I want to do this by X time period. And, All right. Okay. And now I'm out there with it. And maybe how right. can you help me make that happen? How can you encourage me? How can you give me advice? Because you did that last year. I want to know how you did that or um, whatever it happens to be or someone to do it with you and you know, be partners. Right. Um, and I, I think as we look at July 1st coming on here, um, both as individuals you know, and as organizations to be thinking about, well, where are we compared to where, what we said or where we said we wanted to be, you know, at the start of this year and how do we not get to December and just throw up our hands and say, well, you know, we missed the goal or we didn't do what we said we wanted to do only to have to try to go through this process again and run into the exact same thing next year. So, well, I th- that's, seems to put some time pressure too, I think on people, individuals and on businesses, because we didn't get it done in, in Q1, Q2. And now we're staring down the barrel of, I mean, Q4 is going to be here rapidly. And now the pressure is even, even more intense. My grandmother on my, my mother's side had a little thing hanging in her kitchen that I'll always remember as a little kid, the hurrier I go, the behinder I get. And it's true for us individually and in business and we try to make up, I think for lost time, I'm wondering how much of that in your opinion is due to, you know, people not 
really wanting what they say they want, but I'm wondering how much of that is just clarity on their part of not really, not really sussing out what are you after exactly or what is the challenge or what is the, I think there's definitely some of that. I also think that the further behind we get, the more closed we become. So when we, if you think about it, like a, the time where you need the most help is the time that you're asking it less and the time, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Because right, right. here, here I, I started off and all right, I'm good. I got my team, I got this, or I'm doing it, my, whatever it happens to be. Um, and when you start falling behind, that's when you know I want to admit that you've got these things going on or admit you need help or ask for uh, advice on something. And I think that gets us into a terrible trap. Um, you know, both whether it's uh, individual or people inside companies who are trying to look good for their boss or look good for their fellow um, employees. They don't want to admit that there's something they can't handle. There's something going on, you know, in, in um, these peer groups, right? I do workshops all the time and it's fascinating to see how if you get a bunch of CEOs in a room, even many of them are far more likely when it comes to talking about, um, difficult challenges they're having in their life to talk about the personal challenges they may be having at home. It could be with their marriage. It could be with a, with a teenager. It could be with you, you name it. But when you ask that same person or if that same person is challenged in their own minds to actually bring something forward that says, I am struggling with this. I can't handle this at work. uh, That becomes actually far more difficult. Really interesting. Yeah, and the and the oddity or the irony maybe is our I want to lose the ten pounds and I want to use it yesterday, but then my reluctance to ask for help when I need it. I mean, it's it's the yin and yang of the whole thing. Earlier is better. It's I mean, same thing in healthcare. You know, you have these conversations with people, and yeah, you know, I I knew I had this lump right here, or I had a lump in my hand, I just ignored it, and yeah, that never works. I mean, that never works. Better to be on the front end of it than the back end of it. Yeah, I'd like to think that we will we would do one of two things at the start of a year. Either let's not put ourselves or anyone else through the, you know, repeated exercise of failure, you know, when it comes to New Year's resolutions. Just say the heck with it. I know I won't do it. I'm not going to declare it. I'm forget it. You know, or <laughs> or actually, you know, say, I really do want this for myself. This really isn't impossible. I see other people doing it all the time. Uh, you know. I can do this. Um, I may need help doing this. I may need advice. I may need encouragement. I may need uh, someone to you know, hold me a bit of, help me hold myself accountable is kind of how I like to think of it more of someone holding me accountable. But, um, you know, I, I think that uh, if, if we're willing to do that, I think it's pretty simple. Um, but it's it's really about, I think, to your point earlier, which is, first of all, let's be really specific and define what we want and, and think about also why we want it. I think remembering the why is really, really important. Um, you know, there could be any number of goals that we have, and everyone may have the same goal, but they have different reasons for wanting it. And to remember that reason every time you're thinking about falling back or uh, to remember that reason every time you think that you don't want to be asking for help on something. Um, you know, I think it's, I think it's really, really essential. Um, you know what I was um, watching recently, a video that I love on Ted, it's uh, William Urey's The Walk from No to Yes. And he tells a wonderful story, you know, at, at the beginning about 18 camels that I, I would tell it, but he tells it so beautifully that I would just really suggest we'll we'll leave that in the show notes. Listen yeah. to the first two minutes, and it's extraordinary. But what he talks about, uh, he talks about it in terms of conflict. I think if you took conflict and, and just replaced it with the word challenge, um, you find that it's a very much the same formula in that he talks about it as the third side. He said, even in difficult negotiations with um, two sides, there's usually something greater at stake. It's for the kids, it's for our future, it's for the country, it's for the environment, it's whatever it happens to be. And if we can keep that why, you know, in mind, and we can be open to 
what's for the greater good. We often can discover possibilities that we never would have imagined if we just sit in our own, you know, um, isolated place with some type of uh, positional argument that really is a very narrow way of, of looking at a lot of things. So, I, you know, I think for ourselves, uh, when it comes to setting goals and realizing why do we want this? Why does it matter? And if we can tap into why it matters and then I think tap into why uh, or who, who I should say, the people who could help me accomplish what I want to achieve my why. Um, you know, I think that's powerful stuff. And I'd like and to even thank- lean on pe- people to help us, even lean on people to help us figure out, is this really what we want? I mean, even before we, we start the journey, I mean, is this well, and a- I think that, the, and the why oftentimes, you know, helps you get the answer to that. Cause if you can't figure out why, you want what, whatever it is you yeah. want. So it's Game's over. something you're really going to pay much right. attention to or stick with. And maybe you pick another goal of some sort that does have meaning for you or your kids or your parents or the people around you, you know, whatever that looks like. And um, of course in the show notes as well, because you know, of course in the, um, in what anyone can do the book, we talk about um, having a people plan. And there's a people plan and an outline for that. We won't go through it here, but for individuals and for teams. Um, and I think as we start getting, um, you know, really on the doorstep of July 1, um, you know, we've got, um, you know, I think a, a really good opportunity here to look at the second half of this year, be thinking, all right, what is it that I want? Why do I want it? Who can I enlist to help me make that possible? And then, You know, um, and I would love it if people, you know, did it and maybe um, even in the comments um, say, hey, here, um, here's, here's who I am. Here's my goal. Here's why I want it. And I'll get back to you and let you know when I did it. And that would be kind of great, you know, for people to just look at a simple outline um, on the people plan where they can for themselves uh, or if, if you're a company and wants to do the same thing. I think there's some really great opportunity there between now and year end to make some things happen that may not um, otherwise be possible. How do you view the power of of those kind of public declarations? Well, um, I, I, like and I don't mean public in the sense of social media, but just in even in, in the context of a company, you being I part think of they matter. I think when you put yourself out there that this is what you want to do, you, you, when, when you're a company, you're really talking about it, I think, in terms of what your priorities are, what matters to you, you know, and uh, you, you hope that what matters to you also are the same values that your employees, you know, hold dear and the same things your customers hold dear because when you're all in it together, you know, you've got a great chance of, of making those things possible. You don't have to be perfect at it yet. Right, we can have aspirational values that I think hold a real place for us. Most people aren't as good as they want to be with diversity. They're not as good as they want to be, you know, in a lot of areas in their organization. But they're working at it and they're committed to it. And I think when they put out there publicly that this is our commitment to be better here, and they can enlist the support of others where oftentimes customers or employees can give ideas for here's how you could be better. Here's, you know, what you could do to make this stated value and these goals around that possible. Uh, so I think it can be extremely powerful when, when we do that, both as individuals and organizations. I think aspirational values, um, you know, have a real, real place there. From a company perspective, I mean, what, what leaps out to you is the differences as individuals make these pursuits and these decisions and come to wrestle with their why? What, what's, what are some distinguishing differences that you notice when it comes to a team or an organization versus an individual? Um, I, I just think that people can get overly, it's kind of what I mentioned earlier, they, you can get overly focused on the goal. It's that whole thing we talked about with, you know, keeping your eye on the prize isn't always the best advice. You know, right. I mean, you have right. to be focused on what are the things you have to do to make that possible. Um, and by focusing on those little everyday things and having the discipline around that and making sure that you're good at, at those things, um, you know, um, the, the, the 
otherwise whatever you're doing is just like you ho- is like a hope you know people talk yeah. about hope is not a strategy you know yeah right um, so I, I think in that regard uh, well the big difference to me leaps out from a team as far as and you and I have talked before about the difference between teams and group and maybe and maybe that would be a, a it would be fitting to give the audience greater context we don't dwell on it all that often but the distinctions between teams and groups uh, yeah i mean a good you know you know let's face it i mean a group basically at least as we defined it in the power of peers comes together to help one another achieve their individual goals right so if i'm a ceo and i'm part of a ceo group of ceos of other companies we're there to collaborate and to help ourselves be better leaders and help take things back to our companies to make our organizations better and and grow healthier and and all that a team basically is working much more toward a collective goal when a team is going to win a national championship when the team is trying to create a great piece of advertising when uh you know there's the there's a either a singular goal or singular work product that comes from a lot of contributors and oftentimes people contributing different things in different ways in order to do what one person would not be capable of doing so you know, I think any time that we can put that mindset behind it, either way, it comes down to what we learned so well, I think, from our guests during Year of the Peer, all these super successful people from all different walks of life, and not one of them um, suggested, in fact, they all of them, I think, to a person laughed at the idea that they did anything completely right. by themselves. Uh, we need um, being part of groups, being part of teams, and these don't have to be formal, fixed. These can be ad hoc. You know, um, bring together the people who surround you, whether it's at a company or uh, in your individual life. That can just help you get done what you want to get done. And conversely, you would be willing to help them do the same. So if 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 people in our audience, if we've got team leaders, and I'm certain that we do, and, and hire kinds of leaders who may be assembling teams and, and probably aren't looking at second half, but are probably already definitely deep in thought about the fourth quarter. If you are more formally gathering a team and you're facilitating this group to make such a decision so that you can collaborate to the max, get the highest amount of buy-in that you can get what are some things that you have learned in all of your dealings with, with teams and, and even groups that might would help that leader facilitate that? So I, I think um, it really goes back to what we do in the workshops and what we learned about the five factors, both in how they work for groups and teams. One is you've got to have the right people in the room. And I think it's the leader's job always to make sure that you've got the right people in the room who have the skills, who share the values and who have the commitment to getting done what has to get done, that the people are committed to one another as well as they're committed to the goal. I think it's essential. Um, You you know, in the Google study, we talked about um, where psychological safety is, is such a key element for teams, right? People have to believe that it's okay to make a mistake. It's okay to admit you're wrong. It's okay to, you know, to do certain things that keep everything really transparent so that people can help one another fix things more quickly and not have things, you know, go to a point where someone is keeping it, um, you know, a secret only to get to a point where it gets so bad, then it has to become visible. And now all of a sudden there's less, if anything, you can do sometimes uh, to help them. Uh, I think third is really focusing on productivity. Uh, you can have a lot of, you can have light, right people in the room. They can really trust one another. And, um, but are they being as productive as possible? And as the leader, how do I help them be productive? Um, how do I run meetings? Do I have too many? Do I not have enough? Are they too long? Are they too short? Are they, uh, they make people feel like they're being heard. Do they really know what's going on? Um, how do we do calendaring? How do we manage people who, uh, based on various commutes they may have or whatever, who may be more productive if several days a week they were able to work from home? You know, all kinds of things like that, which we can look at from a productivity standpoint, which then I think puts you in a position where you can create a culture of accountability where, again, the team members are accountable to one another. They're not just... Um, you know, account, worrying about their supervisor or trying to be accountable to the CEO, 
but that their currency with the other employees is based on the commitment that they all share and they model those behaviors for one another and they have expectations for one another because they depend on each other because everyone contributes usually something uh, a little bit different uh, on the team. And then finally, I think for the leader to reflect on themselves, um, to not to make sure that the right people are in the room and that they've got that psychological safety and that there's productivity and accountability. But for them to always be thinking about how am I as the leader supporting this team? How do I do a good job of that? Knowing that I'm as the leader of this team, want to be part of the team, not apart from it, which allows me to really participate and model behaviors that I hope others, um, you know, will, um, you know, emulate. Um, and it's it's really being for the team, not for your own self-aggrandizement and, you know, to be, right. again, steward of those other factors that we talked about. But, you know, those things, I think when we start looking at the back half of the year, also is for a leader, which is a good point, I think you're, you're leading to here, which is really looking at these factors and saying, how are we doing? How, how am I doing against each of these areas? Um, and I think uh, be a really good point in the year to self-assess and reassess that, make any adjustments you need to make and kind of go forward from the year and finish out the year strong. Yeah, very good. The website is leobatari.com. That's L-E-O-B-O-T-T-A-R-Y.com. We'll put links to some of these things. We're doing more and more of that, and I, I hope the audience is finding that helpful. The things that we kind of refer to and talk about, even some of the books that we mentioned, putting links so that you don't have to go hunting all around. You can just go to leobatari.com and find that. Well, there we go. That's good. So what's uh, so uh, what do you got um, as you think about the back half of your year? Any um, goal come to mind that you want? Oh, uh, yeah, you got to get that group started. Yeah, that's the big. That's, yeah, you. that's 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 the big goal. And and I'll yeah, and I'll show a little bit of my underwear in you know a Reader's Digest fashion uh, for the old heads that even understand that reference. Um, you know, stuff happens. Life gets in the way. Uh, you, you've had some some challenges in the last year. I've had some challenges, and and it's not that we we air we air all this dirty laundry, but for all of us individually and people on teams or in groups, life gets in the way. You know, stuff happens, and it's not perfect. And everybody would like this hockey stick kind of a life. It's just not realistic. It doesn't happen. Uh, I'm talking to a 22 year old the other day who's you know coming out of Texas A&M, and boys just thinking, you know got the world by the tail and you know until life hits him square in the face or lower and you know it's just not not how life goes so I'm one of those people like so many life has gotten in the way but I've let it you know stuff happens to us and thanks to you and some other nudging so yeah for me the elephant in the room is is the peer advantage by Bula Network you can find out more by going to the peer advantage I'm really committed to small business owners and that's what this is. This is for, um, I've just in all candor, I've just got to get off my butt and, you know, and give it, give it more effort. I think so much of this for an individual as well as for teams, it boils down to resilience. It just boils down to, will you, will you quit or will you keep going? You know, and I'm reminded of, you know, the famous, the famous Navy SEAL training 200, 200, and these are elite sailors already, right? I mean, they're all put forth by their commanding officers. 200 guys go in the class, and there's this one simple device, a bell, you know, and you can make it all quit. You can make it all go away. And all but 10% ring that bell and say, I'm done, you know, and it's the way the Navy, I mean, how else is the Navy going to figure out who's going to quit and who's not going to quit? And it's the purpose of the training. And I rather view our lives professionally and personally. It's the same. It's the same game, except we can ring the bell, but the beating still continues. So my question is, why ring the bell? Why not just keep moving forward? You know, it's one thing if you don't have your goal clearly established or if you change your mind, which is perfectly okay. People change their minds all the time, you know. So I'm thinking, I want to get this group going. I've just I've just got to do it. That's all there is to it. You know, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You just keep 
pushing forward and, and doing it. Uh, my, my big challenge, as you well know, and, and for whatever value this is for the audience, and I hope it is, because I know there are so many people that whole fake it till you make it conversation that we had at the top of the show. Um, as I've gotten older in life, I've gotten more aware of, of who and what, what I am. And one thing I know that I am not, and you and I've had this conversation off the air. I'm not a self promoter, just not, I don't judge people who are, it's much easier for me to promote you. Mm-hmm. And I do, and I feel good about it than it is, you know, to promote me. That's just, that's who I am. Now I could sit here and lament and go, well, you know, it's that famous, you can't teach a fish to, you know, climb a tree, whatever that genius comment that Einstein supposedly made, you know, so I can sit here and go, okay, I'm a fish. Why am I, why am I climbing trees? What's the point in that? But I do think to the topic of our show, I think these resolutions, these goals, these, these initiatives, you know, are we being, forget if we're being realistic or not. I mean, is it really what we want? And to the point of the Michaela Schifrin kind of a thing, can we enjoy the process? Can we be good at the process along the way? There are a lot of things that I'm not going to be in life, maybe not because I don't have the talent or the propensity for it, but I hate it. Mm. You know, I hate it. So, so what's the point, you know, of that when it comes to the individual? So I'll get, I'll get off my pulpit now, but hey, oh, I think resilience right. and just tenacity and just, I would encourage anybody in the audience if you've been knocked out and you've been dragged out and you have, we all have, yeah. get over it. You know, I, I know that can sound like empty advice, but you're in grand company. Every human, every human has, has gone through it. Uh, you know, and I don't, I'm not one of those that believes we can just do anything we put our minds to, but boy, do I believe that we can do so much more. You know, I mean, we, we limit ourselves severely and quit way too soon. You know, it's that Seth Godin dip thing. The problem is you don't know how big or how fast the dip is. Mm. So what's your choice? You know, swim back or keep going, hoping that sooner or later you're going to get there. Well, that's right. Um, And I think when you look at a lot of, um, there's a lot of great stories out there of people, I don't care if they're sports figures, actors, whatever, that literally if they quit the day before of their big break, they never would have. Right. (laughs) <laughs> That's right. Accomplish what they did. Exactly right. I think there's there's real, you know. I think about you know these workshops that I'm doing this year, which are which are great and fine. But I see the value of what happens when I'm in that room for three hours and the transformation that happens on these people. Right. Um, but I I need to scale that, and I need to yeah. figure out, uh, you know, how best to do that. And I'm uh, and. And interestingly enough, ironically, I'm trying to do a much better job of really reaching out to people who understand how to do that well and understand how to do it you know, better than I do to look at something that I would just that I just want to share with more of the world, uh, because I think there's there's real value there. So I think for me in the next six months, it's going to be really getting to a place where I figure out how to be more impactful to more people. Um, so that's, yeah, and I think that's, I think that's a, I think that's a really under, I think that's a really understated kind of a, kind of a truism, especially for, for people in our demographic, you know, Leo and I are, I mean, if you're listening, if you don't watch, I mean, I'll give you is watch the video and you'll, you'll see we're not 20 somethings, but I was having a conversation with a a gentleman about my age the other day. And you know, I mean, we've never been better. You and I have never known what we know. We've gone through so many economic cycles. I started my career. It was the mid seventies, the oil embargo. I was in high school, but I was, I started out selling cereal. So I've seen all that. I was telling a young couple the other day, my wife and I bought a house, 17% mortgage rate. I can't even imagine that, you know? Uh, And so all of that endurance, all of that experience now at this point in our life, I mean, here's a challenge, I guess, to us or anybody like us. And it's kind of reminiscent of Rich's book, The Late Bloomers. These people who feel like, ah, you know, what have I got to offer? Tons, tons and tons and tons to offer uh, of people who have not seen that experience. Not in a judgy way. You know, it's not like, okay, well, we know what's best. We just know what we know. And there's probably value in that. 
Leo and I, our relationship started because I reached out to him because he had co-authored this book, The Power of Peers, and I was deeply curious and interested about it and wanted to know more about it and told him, I want to learn. I want to learn. I want to know as much as I can what you know. That's how this whole relationship got started. And here I am, you know, on the cusp of trying to launch uh, a first virtual group. And And you will do that this year. Yeah. And it's going to be great. Hey, before we run too, I just want to give a shout out. Actually, I'll be leaving for um, Boston this weekend to help um, my dad celebrate his 80th birthday. And uh, so really uh, excited about that. Looking forward to that. And um, um, yeah. Happy birthday to him. Good stuff. Yeah, Yeah. That's awesome. You know, so anyway. That's hey, awesome. Um, well, you got some other stuff coming up. I mean, real quick. So give us kind of a reader's digest version, like now through now through August, just some highlights. Because I know you got one big one. We've talked about it once before, but not Yeah. Not. Um, so I'll be, doing, uh, I'll be doing some workshops, um, not so much in July. I'm really kind of hunkering down in July, trying to get a lot of writing done. Um, I've got a, a number of workshops. Uh, you know, um, different cities in the U.S. Uh, in August, but then I'll be uh, speaking at um, a conference in Oslo. Uh, of course, we had Jennifer uh, Bessels on the show and be speaking at the uh, Executive Growth Alliance conference. I'm really excited about what they're doing, and um, and it may be interesting to see, you know, at what level I may get involved with that. Um, initiative because it's it's really great stuff and really um, you know excited about that and you know I'll be um, getting to spend more time uh, with Jennifer and some of the other leaders uh, of that group in July uh, be there at the conference in uh, the end of August and really look forward to um, what they're doing um, you know and again I, th- I think it's exciting because to me it's a, it's another level of benefit to peer groups when peer groups um, are comprised of people within a similar ecosystem that start looking at that third side, like we talked yeah. about, right? And yeah. they really understand the why and people willing to work together for the the greater good. And yet it will be to everyone's benefit. Uh, so yeah, and we'll think, put links um, in the show note to that, that initiative, because you need to, whether you're interested or not, it, give it a, need, give it a you need to know you're about gonna, you're going to be interested in it because it's a really unique initiative. Yeah. Exactly. No, it's great stuff. But um, anyway, um, look, hope you, uh, you know, have a great weekend and uh, you know, we'll get started in July um, and we'll get that group uh, up and running and we'll get, yep. do the That's things right. we want to do this year uh, exactly as well. So That's anyway, exactly right. happy birthday. Right. Year to that. We'll do Have a good one. See you, everybody. to learn more about our show and what we do to submit questions to us and to subscribe to what anyone can do podcast please visit our website what anyone can do.com what anyone can do podcast is hosted by leo batari and me randy cantrell music provided by kevin mcleod is vibe ace licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0 license. Thanks for watching or listening. We hope you'll share the podcast.